This is the new Tesla Model S Plaid, and it's an absolute marvel of, well, everything. But it's especially known for speed. This does zero to 60 in two seconds. Yes, you heard that right. Two seconds, zero to 60. Your favorite supercar or hypercar, this family sedan is faster. And it doesn't matter which your favorite supercar or hypercar is, this is faster than all of them. This car is amazing, and today I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website with cool cars from the modern era. We've had some great sales recently on Cars and Bids, including this manual transmission Porsche Cayenne, which sold for just over $30,000. This E46 M3 Competition 2006 model sold for $44,500. And this 2018 Ford Raptor brought $68,000. If you're looking to sell your cool car from the modern era, the 1980s and beyond, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. We have an amazing platform and you will get the most views and interest in your car. And if you're looking to buy a cool car from the modern era, check out Cars and Bids now with free listings through the end of August using the promo code BIRTHDAY when you submit your car. So let's talk plaid. The numbers are staggering and they are endless. This car starts around $130,000, which is big money, but it delivers in a big way. Tesla claims this is the first production car to ever do zero to 60 in under two seconds. There's been some controversy about the exact zero to 60 time, but fighting over tenths of a second is missing the point. This car is fast, unquestionably the quickest zero to 60 car on sale ever. And it's not just zero to 60. The Model S Plaid will run a quarter mile in the nine second range, which is absolutely catastrophically fast. This will outrun every other vehicle you will ever encounter on the road in the entire history of the production automobile, period. But wait, there's more. This car has over 1,000 horsepower. Tesla says it's capable of 200 miles an hour, which is definitely supercar territory. And it's fully electric, like all Tesla models, and it can go just under 400 miles fully electric between charges. And it has five seats, so it's practical. In fact, one of the selling points for this car on Tesla's website is that you can get an entire bicycle in the back without having to remove a wheel. That is a selling point of the world's quickest car ever. Ever made. And today I'm going to show you all of it. First, I'll take you on a tour of the Model S Plaid and show you all of its many quirks and features. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, which sounds terrifying, frankly, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of the Plaid inside the car with the interior because that's the big news for the Plaid, aside from all the power, because the interior has been fully redesigned for the Plaid. Everything is new in here. Tesla says they've only kept the seat rails, and you'll be able to see all the new stuff as I go through everything, but probably the most important and controversial new item in this interior is the steering wheel, which, as you can see, isn't a wheel. Tesla calls it the yoke and it's supposed to be like a fighter pilot joystick kind of thing, because this car is so fast, it deserves something special to control it. Like I said, very controversial. A lot of people are viewing it kind of as a gimmick and something that's sort of silly and stupid. Others think it's really cool. Generally, it's accepted that it's kind of difficult at low speeds because you don't have a wheel to just grab. I don't know, we'll see what I think in a minute when I drive this car near the end of this video. I haven't tested it out yet, but that is the yoke and it's standard in all Plaid models, at least for now. But beyond the yoke itself, just being a yoke, 
there are several other interesting yoke related items in here starting with the controls tesla has a desperate desire to make all their interiors tremendously minimalist and get buttons and clutter out of everything and that means some unusual controls in this car for instance you look at the steering column and you don't see any stocks coming off for turn signals or windshield wipers it's all been integrated into the yoke or the screen turn signals are now a button on the left side of the yoke you can press over here left or right and that will turn on or off your turn signals while you're driving around no more stock like every other car headlights are not mounted on the dashboard a little dial you turn like most cars instead you press this button on the yoke and it pulls up the headlight control in the center screen and then you can adjust stuff from there that's how you activate the headlights in this car and check it out even the horn is a little button on the yoke you can see over here on the right side of the yoke you have a little horn symbol you press that and the horn sounds and that's how you turn on the horn in the plaid all little buttons controls integrated into the yoke everything here is weird and it gets weirder because you look around the yoke the center and you'll notice there's no gear selector anywhere in this car you can't shift into gear on the column there's no like buttons in the center how do you do it the answer is it's predictive it predicts what gear you want to be in and then it will automatically shift into that gear for instance i just got in the car and turned it on the first thing that pops up in this gauge cluster screen is it says put your foot on the brake if you want to go into reverse how did it know i want to go into reverse probably because sitting in front of me there's a large garage door and a house that i don't want to hit so you put your foot on the brake and then you're in reverse and you can back up and that's the predictive gear selector in this car now it's worth noting you can easily override this predictive gear selector anytime you want on the screen there's this little car icon over to the left and you move that car in the direction you want to travel so if i did want to go forward like move up a few feet whatever i would slide this car forward and then i would be in drive if i wanted to go in reverse i would slide the car backwards then i'm in reverse and that is sort of the backup gear selector in this car your main gear selector is predictive the car suggests a gear and you go with it and your backup is a little slide car on the screen but you're thinking what if this stuff fails what if the screen fails you can't get the car into gear then and the answer is no there's actually another backup gear selector and that would be in the center console here next to the hazard lights you can faintly see outlines for P R N D. this does not work it's not programmed to turn on unless the screen itself crashes or fails and then somehow it knows that the screen has failed and it turns on the gear selector and then you can shift into gears down here using these buttons but they're going to be completely dark until that happens you're supposed to just use the gear selector on the screen or just listen to the predictive gear selector tell you what gear you should be in but anyway speaking of the screen this giant center screen in this car is all new part of the redesign interior and I will get to that in a second first I want to talk about some other stuff starting with the climate vents there are none you don't see any you look around this interior there's no big climate vents like every other car and that's because they are hidden Tesla has hidden the climate vents on the driver's side you can see there's sort of this opening below and above the gauge cluster screen and that's where your climate control air blows from over on the passenger side they've sort of hidden the climate vent into these lines on the dashboard this trim and that too is a hidden air vent for the passenger side again Tesla really wanted to make this interior minimalist to declutter and that meant sort of removing all of the well clutter including climate vents they're now hidden but they do blow out a lot of air it feels just like regular climate vents in here you just can't see and in fact this minimalist trend continues basically everywhere you look let's go into the center console you can see there's nothing in here in fact the only control is the hazard lights in the very center that's it everything else is just well nothing no controls it's all integrated into the screen with that said there are some neat items worth noting in here for one above the hazard lights you have this little sort of velvet pad that is a phone charging pad you put your phone down and it will inductively charge your phone it doesn't like say what it is it doesn't give you instructions but if you put your phone on it it will charge again minimalist they don't need to tell you what it is you figure it out also in the center console you have kind of a trick little center storage area in here you can see right now it's just this large hole of storage in the middle 
middle, but if you tap on this little lower silver panel, a smaller storage area reveals itself to you, or you can press it again and put it away. Or if you tap on the back part of the storage panel, cup holders will come out and reveal themselves to you as well, or again, you can tap them and put them away. You also have a lid for this center storage panel, although strangely enough, it only goes over half of the storage panel. I guess they're thinking that most people will want the cup holders to be exposed all the time so the lid doesn't have to cover the whole thing, but it's still kind of weird. Now behind all that, you also have another center storage area with an armrest on top, and that is, like in most cars, just little center console storage. Nothing weird there. But anyway, next up, let's talk center screen because this is the nerve center of the car, all of the controls, and there are some very interesting quirks and features in this center screen, which I will show you. But let's start with the climate control. Now, you can easily make simple adjustments to the climate control by tapping the little number in the lower left. That's your air temperature, and you can move that left or right to change the temperature, and you can also turn on your heated or cooled seats there, and the window defoggers, that sort of thing. But if you want more climate controls, you have to press that climate control area, and then it pops up a larger climate control screen. Now, within that screen, there are quite a few interesting quirks. For one, you can choose where the air is flowing from by tapping like a virtual image of the dash board on the car. You can see, tap the passenger side and it starts to flow out the passenger side, or you can turn it off, direct the air in other ways, and that's kind of a cool look since you can visualize exactly what you're seeing. Now, at the top of these controls, you have a little slider you can use to adjust fan speed, but my favorite part here is you have a little atomic button that you can press, and that will maximize the air speed coming out, and you'll get bombarded with air conditioning or heat by pressing the atomic symbol, which I guess makes sense. And speaking of interesting symbols in here, how about the one for the heated steering wheel, which of course is actually a heated yoke. You turn it on here and it looks like a yoke with heating. It's just kind of funny to see it shown like that in a little image. Now in the climate controls, you also have two other really cool settings in here. One is dog mode. You can see over on the right. If you activate that, the car can be completely turned off and locked, but the climate control will stay on and keep it cool in here so that you can leave a pet in the car if you want to run into the store or whatever. And also a big warning pops up on the screen saying, this car is in dog mode. Don't worry, the dog is just fine in case like passersby see the dog and start to become frantic because they think it's gonna die. Now, the other cool mode you have in here is called the camp mode. You can see over on the right camp, you press that and it will leave on the car, the climate control, all of the functionality until it gets down to 20% battery. Normally the car will automatically shut off after a while. Frankly, most cars do, even non-electric ones. But if you have camp mode on, I guess it thinks you're like sleeping in the car, whatever, and you're gonna want all the stuff to remain on. And it will only shut off at 20% because it doesn't want to completely kill the battery while you're inside. But that's a cool feature too. But anyway, next up, moving on from climate to the icons along the bottom of the screen, these are just like the shortcuts that you use frequently. So for instance, your phone is down here, your music and media can be accessed down here, pretty simple stuff, the camera system in the car. But my favorite little icon along the bottom is the toy box, which brings up the entertainment features. There are quite a few. One of them is a web browser that you can use to access the very finest websites on the internet. And you can see them in full screen resolution in your Tesla using your Tesla web browser built into your giant center dashboard screen. But the toy box also has some actual toys. For instance, there's a video game console built into this. And you can play various different games using the arcade function. There are all sorts of preloaded games. My very favorite is this like beach buggy racer game where you can actually race cars while you're sitting in your car. And here's the coolest part. You use the car's controls to control the cars on the screen. And you can see I'm racing right now using the actual accelerator and brake pedal from the plaid and the yoke to steer my little car as it's driving along in the video game. I am using an actual steering wheel and stuff to steer in a game. And that is just the coolest thing in the world. And it's a cool way to pass time, like if you're waiting for someone or whatever. And of course, you can use it like while you're sitting in your garage, because unlike gas powered cars, there are no emissions coming out of this. So you can just sit there and play video games in your car <laughs> to your heart's content, if that's what you want to do. But unquestionably, the craziest thing in the toy box is the section called boom box, which allows you to change 
car sounds. What I mean by that is you can have a driving sound appear so that while you're accelerating, a custom sound plays as if it's an engine note. You can choose between these various different sounds that will play while you're accelerating since this car doesn't have an engine note. That is crazy, but even crazier is the horn sound. You can customize the sound of the horn. You can see here there are various different preset options you can use to change the sound of your horn. And yes, they change the sound of your horn. Take a listen. Right now I'm pressing the horn and it sounds like a normal car horn, but I replace the horn sound with, let's say, applause, and then I press the horn button and, well, take a listen. Yes, that's right. It's now applauding when I press the horn button and you can make the horn do other things too. Here's another horn sound. And if that wasn't crazy enough, you can change the driving sound and the horn sound to your own custom sounds. You plug in a little USB and you can actually like upload your own sounds to the car so you can have the horn sound like whatever you want. If you want the horn to be your own voice yelling, <laughs> you can do that. And every time you press the horn, you'll be yelling in your car. That is just insane. But anyway, some other interesting items in this center screen area. If you go into pedals and steering, you will see the option for drag strip mode, a little rocket on it. And if you put the car in drag strip mode, it like lowers itself and then it takes a few seconds to prepare for a launch, the fastest launch in the world of any production car. There's also a little icon over here that says how to launch and it explains exactly the procedure you have to go through in order to get the fastest possible launch time. Pretty insane. And one other cool safety setting you can turn on or off sentry mode, which is this feature that sort of monitors the car when it's parked. And if something were to bump up against the car or like push the car or hit it, it will activate all the exterior cameras so it will show what's going on. And it will alert you that sentry mode has turned on on your phone, which is pretty cool. That way you can see exactly what happened when you were parked, when something bumped up against the car, so you know what's going on. And finally, one other very cool feature of the screen, the screen working in conjunction with the yoke, I love how you adjust the mirrors and the steering wheel position in this car. You go into controls and you turn on like the mirror control activation and then you use this little dial on the left side of the steering wheel to move the mirrors up, down, left, right. You can do it all with this little dial. That's so cool. And the steering wheel yoke control is even cooler. You actually move the dial and the yoke will move up, down, in, out, depending on how you're adjusting the dial. And I just think that's so awesome. The coolest part is when the dial is not being used to move the mirrors of the steering wheel, it's the volume control. So this is like a multi-purpose dial depending on exactly what you're doing and which function you're using. Love that. And next up, speaking of screens, important to mention this car has a gauge cluster screen directly above the yoke right in front of the driver, just like the prior Model S did, but unlike the Model 3, which only has the center screen. And this gauge cluster screen tells you obviously all the pertinent information, like your current range, the outside temperature, the speed you're going, and it shows you various autopilot things that you might need while you're driving, where cars are around you, that sort of thing. Nice digital gauge cluster screen, nothing too unusual or special or weird about it, but it's there, and frankly, it's pretty useful compared to the no gauge cluster in the Model 3. I definitely prefer to have something right in the driver's line of sight. With all that said, and my clear enthusiasm showing for all the cool technology and screen stuff in this car, I think there's a little bit of screen overkill in the pursuit of minimalism in this interior. For example, in a normal car, you want to lock out the windows so your kids can't roll up and down the windows incessantly. You just press a little button by the window switches and then they're locked out. In this car, you got to go to the screen, press the little car icon in the bottom left to pull up the settings, go to the lock section, and then tap on the window lock. It's just excessive. It's a four-step process. It's something that could have been easily integrated into the window switch area and the doors without really screwing up the minimalism thing. And frankly, I will never get behind the idea of an electronic screen-based release for a glove box. Same deal, you could have made a latch down here at the bottom of the dashboard that nobody would have ever really seen, but instead you gotta go into the screen, the car settings section, the controls, and that's how you open the glove box. Just a little excessive and it's a little too screeny. Seems like they've maybe gone too far in that direction, but most of the stuff I think is really cool. But anyway, next I wanna move on to the last interior function, at least in the front seats, and that would be getting out, opening the door. 
door. To do that, you press this little button on the door pull, that's like a car with a door open. You press that, and then the door electronically opens, and you push it open the rest of the way, which is pretty cool. But you're thinking, well, this is an electric car. What if the battery dies? How do you open the door then? You have a backup right in front of the window switches. This is a door handle, and if you pull that, it will mechanically unlatch the door so that you can get out and not use the electronic system. The problem with doing this is when you pull that latch, an icon pops up on the screen that says your window trim may be damaged by using this mechanical backup door release. I suspect that's because when you use this release, the window doesn't do its little slight drop to break the seal with the door trim, and so you might damage the trim because of that. So use the electronic door release when you're climbing out. And next up, we move on to the back seat and the plaid. And the first thing you notice back here is it's way better than the outgoing Model S model. Like I said, the entire interior was redesigned, and one benefit was more interior room, especially for the back seat, and you can really tell. I now have a lot more space back here, leg room, knee room, head room, just a lot more space in the back for rear passengers, which is nice since this is ultimately like a people carrying family sedan. Also worth noting, you do have three across seating back here. A lot of high performance four door cars are two in the front, two in the back, but not this one. You have three seats, a middle seat, seat belts, so you have five total seats in the plaid. Now, if you want a center armrest, you also have that possibility here. Strangely enough, it's electronically released. There's not just a simple latch, there's a little button you press behind the headrest, and you can hear it release electronically, and then you drop this center armrest, and you have cup holders, a little storage area, and of course a nice little armrest to make your existence more comfortable in back. But the big news in the back seat of the plaid is the screen in the center back here facing the rear seat occupants. There are several different things you can control in this screen. One is your climate controls. You can pop into the screen and adjust the fan speed here, as you can see, and you can also adjust the climate control temperature and back, but again, no vents. Instead, the vents are hidden above the little screen, tiny little vents that force out air very quickly to make it comfortable back here. Unfortunately, one drawback of all the hidden vents, most cars with rear climate control have vents on the sides along the B pillars, and because Tesla wanted to hide all the vents, they didn't put any there, and so you're only getting air kind of right from the middle from a relatively small vent, and it doesn't do a great job of cooling down the rear on a really hot day like today. You could definitely use a few more rear vents back here. But anyway, speaking of rear seat climate, here's another great feature of the screen. You can turn on the heated seats, and that includes a heated center seat. Not just the outboard rear seats are heated, but the middle seat is too, which you'd never really see on any car, because most people don't use the middle rear seat, but it's heated in the plaid. But by far the coolest part of this screen is the enter entertainment component of it. You have a little film reel icon, you tap that, and then you can access several different entertainment apps built into this screen. You have Netflix, Hulu, Twitch, and of course the finest one, YouTube, where you can watch some of your favorite content creators make videos if you'd like. Now, one other really cool thing about this rear seat screen, it also comes with video games just like up front, and it even comes with a handheld console. It's not included in this car, unfortunately. This car doesn't have the video game system back here, but that's an option you can get on your Plaid, a built-in video game system with a Tesla-specific video game console so that kids can play back here while you're driving them along. Or kids can play in the back their video games, and the people up front can also play their video games on the front arcade. This car has multiple video game systems. Not bad for the quickest car ever made. And next we move outside the plaid where there are quite a few more quirks and features, starting with simply getting inside. This is the key you get when you buy a plaid. It's sort of sleek, it's shaped like a plaid, and it has no buttons. That's because the car can detect when you're walking up to it. And as you approach with the key in your pocket, you can see the door handles pop out. That's when the car is unlocked, and then you just walk up, pull on the door handle, and you can climb right in. And it's the opposite when you walk away. As you walk away, the car senses you have left, and then eventually it locks the doors, and then you're all set. You don't ever have to take the key out of your pocket. You don't even have to like tap the door handle. The car recognizes everything. Now, it is worth noting there are some buttons hidden on the key you can tap to manually lock or unlock the doors in case it isn't working, but in my experience, it actually worked pretty well, and it recognized the moment I left and the moment I walked up each time. Now, speaking of entering the car, here's a brilliant Tesla idea. The spare key isn't a key itself or a fob. Instead, 
said, it's a credit card. This thing here is your spare key. And that way, if you misplace your key, whatever, you got this in your wallet at all times so you can still get access to your car and drive away. And that is a pretty brilliant feature, a spare key that is a credit card. Another cool feature on the outside in terms of accessing stuff is the charge port, which is brilliantly integrated into the taillights and the rear reflector on the driver's side. You just tap the reflector and then it pops open, revealing the charge port. And then of course you plug the car in and it charges. On the other side, you have a reflector there that's just a reflector, not a charge port at all. It has no other function. You have a hidden charge port behind a reflector. That is pretty cool. And the cool continues with some other great upgrades to the exterior for the Plaid model. Now, in order to create this high performance, ultra fast car, Tesla needed bigger tires. And that meant wider tires. And that meant they needed to widen the car itself. So the Model S Plaid is a little wider than the regular Model S. When you look at the front of the car, if you're very familiar with the Model S, you can tell it's a little wider, a little more aggressive, and a little bit more muscular. Frankly, it's pretty difficult to tell, actually, unless you have the two next to each other. But when you do, it is very obvious that the Plaid is just a little wider, a little more aggressive. With that said, there are no other major upgrades to the outside of the Plaid that let you know this is the special one. These wheels are optional, only available on the Plaid, these 21-inch wheels. So if you see those, you'll know it's a Plaid, unless someone changed out the wheels in their regular Model S, they're not necessarily a dead giveaway either. The only other real way you can tell, aside from the wider track, is the Plaid badge in back, but it is very tiny, very subtle, and most people won't even notice it. And I love that. There's something subtle about driving around <laughs> in the fastest accelerating car ever made, and nobody knows you're driving the fastest accelerating car ever made until you take off faster than anything else. But as cool as some of the upgrades are to the Plaid, these subtle changes to make it more aggressive and cooler than the regular one, I gotta call this car out for pretty bad quality, especially on the outside and especially with the paint. In fact, the owner of this car, who has several different cars, sports cars, high-end brands, told me this is the worst car he has ever seen in terms of paint quality. A good example of that is here on the mirror post. This is paint. It's painted on with these little chips here. It's already chipping off. Even though he's barely driven this car at all, it just looks terrible to come that way from the factory. He said it was like that on delivery day. Same deal on the A pillar here. You can see there's like this weird texture to the paint that just doesn't look good. It's almost like a decal was there and ripped off, but that's how the paint is on this car. And the owner said his detailer couldn't remove it no matter what substance they use. It's just not very good. And it's not just the paint. These door handles on the Model S that pop out out when you unlock the doors are kind of notoriously problematic and early Model S's have them fail fairly regularly and I've noticed in this car they're already starting to be kind of troublesome especially the driver one when you go to open the door handle it pops out and then you pull it and it pops out a little bit more when you shut the door it goes back in that little distance so it's ready for you to pull it again except on the driver door it doesn't always do that sometimes it stays popped out it's like stuck in place and then you have to manually kind of push it in in order to make the door handle use again and then you can pull the door and open it another time. This happens I would say one out of every two or three times I try to open the driver's side. It's just not great quality for a brand new car especially considering these door handles aren't new technology. Tesla's been using them for years and Tesla I hate to say it is famous for this kind of thing. They just don't build cars with the same level of quality as most other brands. Tesla people hate when you talk about this stuff but it really is a problem and it's less of a problem on the Model 3 where the car costs 30 some thousand dollars and it's being sold to a guy who's really excited to show his friends that he got this cool new Tesla at $130,000 for a Plaid. The people buying this have had other high-end cars. They own several vehicles and when they compare the two and see these kind of errors, it doesn't look good for Tesla. Let's just put it that way. And next up we move on to the cargo area in this car, starting with the one in back, which is quite large, a function of this car being a hatchback rather than a sedan, which is kind of how everybody thinks about it, but it is a hatchback. And like I said, one of Tesla's big selling points with this car is that you can get an entire bicycle in here without having to remove a wheel, which is crazy for such a fast car. And frankly, just about any sedan, that's a pretty cool feature. Also worth noting in the cargo area, a couple of interesting items. For 
one, most of the floor is removable, and when you remove it, you can see there's more cargo storage underneath the floor for items that maybe you don't want rolling around in the back or you want a little bit more privacy, you have space for those too. Now, it's also worth noting back here, you can unlatch the seats. You have these two little buttons that look like window switches for the seats on either side and back. You pull those and the rear seats unlatch. Unfortunately, they do not fold down automatically. You still have to walk up and kind of push the seats and fold them down. It would be nice to have that auto fold down, especially in a car this size, but probably most people won't really be putting the seats down that often and having the ability to unlatch them is still pretty nice. And also I want to cover the other cargo area, the one up front, the front trunk. Now you can open this in one of two ways. One, you can press the sort of front portion on the key fob. If you hold that down, the trunk will pop open as you can see, and then you just lift it open from there. Or you go into the infotainment screen and there's a little icon for frunk, which of course is front trunk, except combined into one word. Anyway, you press that and that will also open the frunk and then you have access to a little cargo area up here. Not a lot of space up here, but a little bit more in case you max out what's in back or you want something in a smaller space or with a little bit more privacy. Now, might as well also talk power since, well, this is normally where I talk about power with cars. Obviously no engine here, but the car still has over a thousand horsepower. Tesla says 1,020 horsepower, 1,050 pound-feet of torque. Unbelievable numbers thanks to three electric motors which is a lot, and it makes this car really, really fast. Just how fast overall, I mentioned earlier, it'll do 200 miles an hour, but that's not exactly true. Tesla says it can do 200, but right now, these are all limited to 163 miles per hour. Eventually, there will be a software update that takes them up to the full 200, but right now, they are limited to a much lower speed. Still, 163 is pretty fast, 200 would be bonkers, just like everything else about this car. And so that's a thorough tour of the quirks and features of the Tesla Model S Plaid. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, here we go, driving the Plaid. I cannot even begin to explain how excited I have been to do this. Before I get started, I do want to talk about this quality. Quality of this car is just not really ideal. I mentioned the paint issues, I mentioned the door handle, but it goes further than that. It's also like interior quality. It's fine in here, but it's not really that great. And it's funny because yesterday I drove the new S-Class, and I'm not sure if that review has gone up yet or it will soon, whatever, but I, I drove them back to back uh, by chance. And this car just isn't as nice. The stuff in here is nowhere near as nice. You open the door and you get this sort of generic plastic door sill and this kind of cheap looking carpeting, frankly. Now, I admit to you that a lot of people don't necessarily look for those things. They want the performance, but a lot of people want the opposite. They want the highest quality car and the performance is secondary. And if that's you, for the money, this car is not as impressive as it could be compared to like real luxury sedan rivals. But anyway, next up, let's move on to driving the plaid. I want to start with the yoke. A um, lot of controversy about this, like I mentioned before. A lot of people say it's not good at low speeds. Uh, like making U-turns and tight turns and that sort of thing. My own experience agreed it is not good. However, it isn't as bad as I expected it to be. You can kind of use the top of the yoke as if it was like a circular steering wheel and kind of push on it a little bit. Um, I think with some getting used to, it actually wouldn't really be so bad. But anyway, on to the real driving fun of this car. And I'm gonna start with what everybody wants to do. Oh, oh, oh my God. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> there is no acting involved in what I just did. <laughs> I didn't, I had not punched it before. And now that I have, new worlds have opened up. Oh my God. You know, I drove the Taycan Turbo S and that was like this. And I said to myself at the time, it was like a year and a half ago. And I said to myself, this is it. This is the fastest I'll ever go. And now I know what it's like to like go as fast as a person can go. And this feels like a different world. I can't even describe it. Warp speed. It's like everything is coming at you so fast. <laughs> and um, the owner of the car told me, he said, B before you floor it, make sure the wheel's straight. And I was like, hmm, this guy has a lot of Ferraris. And I thought, well, I can handle this. 
but he's right. <laughs> Make sure the wheel's straight. It's like nothing I've ever driven, ever, ever. <laughs> and it's funny because electric cars, I kind of criticize them sometimes because yeah, they're really fast when you start accelerating hard, but when you get faster and faster, they sort of slow down. Well, this, that might be true of this, but I looked down at one point, I was going 110. And so, I mean, even if it does slow down at above that speed, <laughs> it's not really relevant <laughs> ultimately. It re requires you to completely rethink everything you've ever thought about automotive speed. I have to do it again. <gasps> oh my God. It's, 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 it's the craziest roller coaster you've ever been on in your entire life, is what it is. It's also kind of funny because um, I've driven everything. I don't know how many people who've driven the Plaids yet have. I've driven the Koenigseggs, the Bugattis, the you know Pagani, every, everything for LaFerrari. And so it's even more amazing, I think, for me, in a sense, because I've, I've, the experience of those cars is quite something. You, you, you go there that day and you know, I mean, this is a, this is a big moment. You're, you're, you're terrified. You've called your insurance company beforehand to give them information. Hey, I'm gonna drive this expensive car. You're nervous. You're, you're thinking, oh my God, this is such a special thing. This is just a car a dude can buy. This isn't like that. This doesn't have that sense of occasion. Um, you can just do this, and yet you're faster than all that stuff. I have to do it again. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm, I'm blown, both blown away at this experience and mortified that regular people are gonna have access to this. I just can see the headlines now. You know this is, this is gonna lead to some stuff. Um, and, it's, and it's not gonna be just Tesla. You know, Porsche's gonna come out with a faster Taycan and the Audi RS e-tron GT and blah, blah, blah. These cars are common. Um, and and they there it's not it doesn't require skill anymore to afford a car this fast and the handling impression the steering is certainly better than the handling the steering is amazing you, you turn the steering wheel and it's like instant because they've kind of tuned it for that the handling though it, it's just a big car I the model 3 performance definitely out handles this and I mean smaller cars in general and sports cars at the end of the day you know as much as you can make a car fast with technology it's very difficult to actually make a car feel like light and, and sporty and quick um, unless a car is actually light and sporty in terms of in terms of handling but I have to say, I'm probably more impressed by the suspension quality over bumps. Um, it really does a good job, like, soaking up and neutralizing bumps, which I'm surprised by. Um, I'm actually in sport mode, which is maybe even more surprising that it does even that well in sport mode, sport suspension mode. The handling isn't quite match the acceleration for sure. Um, how could it? Acceleration is the greatest, greatest of any car in the world. Handling is pretty good, I would say, for a sedan. And so there you have it, the Tesla Model S Plaid, the world's quickest car, the fastest accelerating production car ever made, a four-door sedan with a video game console in back. It is unbelievable, truly amazing, and I'm thrilled that I had the chance to review it. And now it's time to give the Plaid a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Model S design is old by now, very familiar and not very cutting edge. Plus, I've always found the Model S design surprisingly generic. Plaid looks a bit better than the normal one, but it's still not exactly special or beautiful, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration, easy one, 10 out of 10. Handling is fine, not amazing, but good for a car this size, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Fun factor is strong, the acceleration is truly incredible, but some other metrics like all-out handling and precision suffer a bit, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Cool factor is good, especially right now. The Model S isn't amazingly cool, it's been out so long, it's pretty common, but the Plaid is very neat and hot at the moment, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 37 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This car is very well equipped with a lot of amazing stuff, including fantastic autopilot, which I didn't even touch on in the video because I was so enamored with the acceleration. Anyway, it gets a 9 out of 10, falling just short of a perfect score as it lacks some top luxury features like massaging seats or four-wheel steering or more seat adjustments, the real ultra-crazy stuff. Comfort is normal for a car like this, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is fine, it's good but not great, and it's not helped by Tesla's track record, it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is excellent with a roomy interior and cargo space, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is a great one. It's not a perfect car, but it delivers a lot. Even for its relatively high price, it's a good value, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 36 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 73 out of 100, which places it here against high-performance sedan rivals. The Model S Plaid is the new all-time four-door car Doug score 
champion, beating out the Taycan, the Mercedes AMG GT63, and everything else. And it's only one point shy of the best score I've ever given out, which went to the amazing McLaren F1 and Speedtail. The Plaid is truly fantastic, and it's quite possibly the best all-around car ever made.